This video is a conversation that I had with Dan Clayland and Melissa Stangle, who are the creators, owners and operators of Soltara Retreat Center in Costa Rica. And before that, they built and ran the retreat center called Pulse, which I visited in 2017. So yeah, these guys know a thing or two about how to build and operate retreat centers. Now I've been wanting to sit down and talk with Dan and Melissa for a while, because I think the story of people who build these psychedelic communities in remote locations and cultivate these relationships with local people from a completely different culture of their own is absolutely fascinating. The fact that they did this twice extremely successfully in the space of about five years is pretty mind blowing. In this video, we talk about how you go about building one of these centers, why they actually did it. We talk about psychedelic integration and why it's so important. And given the current situation, we also talk about the effect that coronavirus has had on the ayahuasca community and how we might have to adapt to it. One question I often get asked is, how did you pick which retreat to go on and how do you know which is the right one for you? And my answer is always that you should gather as much information as you can and look for the place which resonates with you the most. And that's how I ended up at Pulse in 2017. And a big part of that was down to these two guys. As you'll hear, they are very humble, grounded, they're clear and rational with what they say. And so that I felt comfortable that these are my kind of people. And I was right and I had an awesome time at Pulse and I will be forever grateful to Dan and Melissa for the part that they played in my own journey. And yes, before anyone points it out, I am fully aware that it says Rachel in the corner of the screen. That's what you get for sharing a PC with your wife. Anyway, without further ado, I bring you Dan Clayland and Melissa Stangle, psychonaut entrepreneurs and the owners and operator of Soltara Retreat Center. Enjoy. Okay, so I'm here with Dan Clayland and Melissa Stangle from Soltara Retreat Center in Costa Rica. And it is a pleasure to talk to you both. It feels like it's a long time overdue. I've been sort of meaning to touch base with you guys for ages. And also, it's a, I mean, it's a real pleasure for me because both of you, perhaps unwittingly, are like the main factors that I'm, I do this, this YouTube channel. Because oh, first yeah. off, from your side, Dan, it was because after my first retreat with Pulse Tours in 2017, that really sort of kicked this whole thing off for me that I needed like a creative outlet. So that was your input. And you probably won't remember, Dan, but uh, you and I had a conversation when we were at Pulse because I, I was there the final week just before you handed it over to Arcana and you'd flown in to, to sort of do a, like a, a final ceremony with all, all, all the staff guys. I don't, you weren't there, I don't think, Melissa. No, um, yeah, I was. Um, but yeah, well, sort of, I pulled you to one side and I was, I was chatting to you for a little bit. And um, as, I, as I mentioned, I don't expect to remember, but I was kind of curious uh, about how, you know, you kind of balance this spiritual activity with this entrepreneurial spirit and I'd just finished reading your book. I'd sort of like, I'd blitz through your, your uh, drink in the jungle in about two days. So yeah, you, you were, sort of, you've both been like a real inspiration to me. And uh, yeah, from, from you, Melissa, it was, it was that positive encouragement that you gave me when you were first starting Soltara and you asked for some video submissions for your letting go campaign. And I sent, I sent in like a short piece and you said, Oh, that's really good. You should do some more of it. So it was amazing. I remember that. <laughs> put some effort into it i was like can we just like put this on our website please yeah i mean i mean it was it really it was it was something i used to do a lot when i was younger and then you kind of you kind of kick-started that uh that realization of how much i enjoy it so yeah i really did want to say like a big thanks to you guys it's really uh you've really sort of like i say have been a, an inspiration to me but maybe a good place to start is just yeah if you, if you just like introduce yourselves to my audience like you know who you are and, and what do you guys do yeah so um my name is Melissa. I am the COO and one of the founding partners with Dan um, of Soltara Healing Center. I come from the corporate world. I come from a science and engineering background. Um, I kind of did my stint in that world for a little bit and really wanted to kind of expand the, my horizons. And I think that there was a lot for me to be learned as I entered into the world of plant medicines for the first time, which was back in 2013 uh, with Dan on one of his very first trips down in Peru when he was kind of just starting out. And uh, we just ended up connecting um, through, through Reddit, actually, through an online forum. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really opened my eyes to just the possibilities of healing in a wider context. I was doing cancer cell research and I was considering doing medical device work um, on the engineering side, but um, I just really felt like there was something missing in terms of um, that approach to healing. 
Um, mm -hmm. So that really opened my eyes. I went back to the US and I did work for a corporate job for a couple of years. Um, hated it exactly as much as I thought I would. <laughs> and uh, within the span of those two years, Dan uh, actually started his kind of going full time with the trips that he was running and then actually opened his own center, which you alluded to, um, Pulse Tours. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, two years later in 2015, he needed someone to help him manage operations. They were kind of expanding and growing. And at the time, that's what I was doing, but for um, a giant warehouse. And so I told him that, you know, if, if he could hire me, I would learn Spanish, sell my things and, you know, drop everything and go to the jungle. So um, took a leap of faith there and uh, worked out really well because I had just the absolute privilege of working with amazing Shipibo healers, getting to really understand my own inner process through working with ayahuasca, heal a lot of things from my past. And um, yeah, and then one thing that uh, really stuck out to me, uh, well, a couple things stuck out to me, but, you know, as we kind of progressed in this project, um, it became clear that the community needed more integration support. Mm -hmm. um, you know, plant medicines were really just mainstreaming at the time, and that was still a very new phenomenon. So people hadn't really um, come up with what it meant to integrate. And so um, that was the one thing. And then the other thing was just really connecting to the traditions. And as these plant medicines were expanding into the world, it very much seemed like uh, a bit of the connection to the tradition was being lost. Um, and so when we had this opportunity to open Soltara, um, he, he asked if I would found it with him. And I really felt like we had an opportunity to kind of take what we had learned from Peru and evolve it into something, um, you know, that, that could be kind of the next step in what was needed by the community. So, um, yeah, so it was a little bit inadvertent that I ended up being an entrepreneur and kind of a, um, the boss here as well, in a way. And so it's, it's, it's been a really um, intensive um, and beautiful learning process for me. But, um, but yeah, here I am, so. Awesome. <laughs> Who's this here guy? He is. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow. Here we are. Here we are. We are here. Um, yeah, it's been an interesting journey, that's for sure, man. Uh, So how, well, I suppose for yourself, then, like, how did how did you, how did you get get started? Like, what was the sort of, yeah, what was your, what made you come to on, start on this path? Well, like many of us, um, I w I struggled to find my place in the world, and um, I had some personal crises that that were kind of resulting in. Uh, physical harm to myself and, and in, in different ways. Um, it, it really just became a natural progression. Uh, I'm kind of maybe an intense person a little bit. And uh, so, yeah, man, I, I kind of reached, a, I kind of reached a, a point of crisis in my life and I, I was aware I was reading about this medicine from some of the authors I was following uh, at that time. And, and so I, I searched out um, an ayahuasca experience for myself and it made a basically a huge impact on me and, and pretty much changed the course of my life. So I, I started following the path and uh, over time, I just got kind of deeper into the world and wanted to continue working with the medicine and also had a background in tourism. So I found it, it was kind of like a means to an end was arranging groups. When I started out it was, was like putting together groups to go and So I could like to, to like pay for my own trips to the jungle, you know, so I'd run a couple of groups every year and get a few people that would, that would basically allow me to go down to the jungle and, and run a group and, and do some adventure travel and have some ayahuasca experiences. And as that progressed, it just, it just continued to um, just be amazing and, and, and have profound effects on the people who came with me and on myself as well. Um, and so it, you know, it progressed into just more frequency and, and then, 
at a certain point in time when this, the stars kind of aligned, it just made sense to build a place in Peru. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that was awesome. I mean, I, I loved it there. It was a beautiful place. It still is a beautiful place. Yeah. But the, the village there, Libertad, will never change. Uh, the center, of course, is still in operation under a different uh, name. Um, but uh, that was great. You know, it was a really amazing kind of rugged adventure building a, a, a ayahuasca center in Iquitos, Peru, in the rugged Amazon hanging out there for a few years, meeting lots of amazing people, working with lots of amazing people. And, uh, and that kind of reached its point of fruition. Um, I, I basically was kind of interested in, in doing different things and running a healing center in the middle of the Amazon is, uh, is a bit of a commitment, you know? You have to, you have to be there. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not the easiest place to get to. So the, the desire kind of arose for me to move on and, and to work on different projects. And so I, uh, I decided to, to sell that center to uh, the, the gentleman who purchased it. Yeah. And um, yeah, from there, it wasn't very long when the team and myself uh, we're thinking that, you know, maybe, maybe doing something in Costa Rica would be a good idea. So I did my research and, and, you know, talked to a few potential investors and, and stakeholders who might want to participate in it. Talked to Melissa and some other people about who might want to help, uh, build it and run it. And, um, yeah, in the same year that I actually within a couple of months, a few months after I, I sold uh, Pulse in Peru, uh, we signed the paperwork and got this property in Costa Rica and uh, started building. So now this is home. This is uh, in kind of a different sense than, than Peru is home. I feel like I could live here for the rest of my life. You know, mm -hmm. like it's uh, it's a beautiful country. It's a, the people here are amazing. The uh, the work we're doing is incredible. It's it's just, it just feels like home now. So I feel like this for me a little easier on the body and mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, it's. Throughout the whole experience of, of um, letting go of the center in Peru, yeah, but that kind of came with its own emotional toll, you know, uh, all that loss and uh, all the special times we had there, and, and all the special people we worked with there. It was, uh, it was, I grieved, you know, when, when I when I when I when I left the jungle, I did spend a, uh, a period of time grieving over the, 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 the feeling of loss over that. So we kind of took a different approach here. We, we really wanted to design not only a retreat center, but a lifestyle here yeah. that was feasible and enjoyable for the long term. So, you know, we've got this really great family, this little Soltara family here right now. Um, my, uh, my, my best friend from childhood, his name is Jesse. He's here running the kitchen and taking care of Melissa. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got a, a, a beautiful, intelligent young lady who I'm dating here from Costa Rica, who uh, I'm really having a, a great time with. And we have really, really talented people that are here working with us, including amazing uh, healers, Shipibo healers who come up from Peru. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have that same uh amazing Shipibo healing experience in, in Shipibo style of the Maloka here. Yet we're just a few meters from the beach and we can hear the sounds of the waves at night when you're in ceremony and you know there are roads and <laughs> cars and uh you know 
Yeah, it's nice. nice <laughs> it is a bit more accessible, and that's one thing that's a real benefit to you know one thing that was completely not not a complete surprise, but a really pleasant one. Um, I would say the majority of the guests that came through um, Pulse in Peru tended to be um, kind of millennial age, um, mostly men, mostly males who just had that adventurous spirit kind of going rugged and all the way into the jungle. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been really wonderful here being a little bit more accessible. People feel a little bit safer. You know, our, our guests, um, the spectrum of guests we have is all ages and, uh, you know, men and women in pretty equal proportions. And about half of the people that come through are over 40 because you know, not everybody wants to go kind of sleep in a tambo in the middle of the Amazon. Sure. Um, they're already uncomfortable in this healing process. And sometimes it's really supportive for people to just know that they feel physically in a safer space. Um, and so that's been a really great way that we can kind of be a bridge between worlds as well. Yeah, I think the, the accessibility thing is is definitely a factor. It's it's one of the reasons that I'm, and I, I've not visited Solteria, but it's definitely on my list to visit. And it's, yeah, it's the difference between, you know, it's still a, a big flight, but it's like an you know, 11 hour flight compared to like 18 hours of flight. And for me, that just, you know, it's particularly when you're going on a retreat, you get to Peru and you, you just spend days recovering from the travel. Whereas, you know, that would kind of, much shorter flight to Costa, Costa Rica. I think that's, that would be the, it's a tipping point, which, which will, will, will get me there shortly. But anyway, there's a lot to sort of unpack there with what you just said. So but I think before we sort of get into that, if I could just sort of touch on just the current situation around like, yeah, this thing that's towering over all our existences at the moment, how has this coronavirus situation sort of affected you guys? And what's the sort of, what's the story there at the moment? Yeah, well, I mean, it's... Well, that, uh, that, was a, that was a look at <laughs> the sideways look at each other. It's been a journey. <laughs> I, I can I'm imagine. I'm sure it has for so many people, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it basically, it, it, it came up in what felt like an overnight speed, right? It was like in the first week of March, we were kind of aware of it, but not really too worried and then the second week of March was like okay people are starting to freak out a bit mm -hmm. and then like in a, a couple of days after that it was like okay we got to shut down right away yeah and indefinitely like yeah. you know the borders closed Costa Rica's closed Peru's closed uh nobody's flying like around the world man nobody's flying right yeah, yeah I've never seen anything like it well nobody's ever seen anything like it. it's crazy yeah, I mean, I was watching that you guys, I thought, did a really good job with the sort of communications and, and, and the transparency of the communication that you were putting out there. And it was kind of, it was quite heartbreaking to sort of, to be reading like the, the messages that you're putting out in real time as you're going through this kind of period of like, okay, is this, this is something, but I think we're okay to kind of like, okay, you know, we need to do some due diligence to like, okay, it's closed. And it was like, oh yeah, I really felt for you guys and uh so i mean what so what, what's the situation everything is completely closed but are, are you kind of got like is your staff still there are you at the center are you still operating in a kind of skeleton way or well man we've got we're not operating at all but we've got eight staff members or actually 10 including me and mel who have been basically stranded here since mid-march they can't mm -hmm. leave we got four healers from peru who want to go home to their families, but they can't get back into Peru. Uh, they've been here for six weeks. We've been closed for six weeks now. And um, and so everybody's just kind of hanging out. I mean, we're having a good time. Mm -hmm. We're hanging out. We're spending lots of family time together. And, you know, we just went out on a hike uh, a couple days ago to a waterfall all together. And so, I mean, we're making the best of it. There's certainly been some significant uh strain put on our finances you know the fact that we're a new company and uh and so that has really been uh, a problem to solve mm -hmm. um but at the same time we're problem solvers and you know um that's what we do for a living and solve problems <laughs> and take ourselves out of disasters so you know <laughs> Certainly the uncertainty of 
knowing, you know, everything seems to be changing and then kind of things people make, you know, plans, governments say, okay, restrictions until this day, and then it gets close and then they're mm -hmm. like, okay. And, uh, so, I mean, it's all, you know, I would, I would be doing the same thing now, taking it kind of a couple of weeks at a time. Um, but it does make it hard to plan for, you know, how we're actually going to stay alive through this. Um, but the, there is some, uh, some realizations, I think right now, there's a lot of things that are coming to light and a lot of problems in the world. I feel like a lot of trauma is coming up and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I know our services are going to be needed more than ever on the other side. And so we're really doing our best to just stay alive. Um, so we can be there, you know, when this is all over. Yeah. I think that's, that's one of the, one of the things that's come up because particularly for myself, I, I was planning to sort of be away on some kind of retreat at, at this point. And those plans just got completely derailed as I'm sure they have for sort of, for many people. Um, yeah, no, no, at the time when people are needing this kind of this healing, this kind of, you know, stress has gone up from people's work. If, they, if they're even in work, then yeah. And it's, it, it's this kind of weird disjointedness of, of, you need this kind of healing even more, but you just know it's just not accessible at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we were just, um, tuning in trip advisor has been kind of running these webinars for travel industry and business. And, um, you know, they, they're basically saying, you know, it's, we're not alone. I mean, the, they've never seen anything like it. The mm. entire travel sector was completely decimated and all of the, you know, pieces that fall from that. And, um, you know, it's not necessarily predicted to be one of the first things that comes back. And so, you know, my, my fear too would be that we bring it back too soon and then, you know, it causes a second wave. So yeah. if there's, yeah, there's definitely a lot at, at stake and kind of, you kind of, it's a lose, lose really, no matter what. So, um, yeah. We're, yeah, trying to, trying to make the best of it. And certainly we're in a, a, a nice place to quarantine. We could be in worse places. <laughs> <laughs> Is, is there any, have you put any thoughts around sort of ways that you can adapt your business model to sort of, I've, I've seen some of the kind of, um, you know, like the kind of telemedicine kind of things that people are doing, you know, where, where people are doing sort of like ceremonies over things like Zoom or over Skype, something like that. Mm -hmm. is, is there some options that there that you think are they're available to you guys? With, I know you're sort of, with your entrepreneurial spirit, you're always looking at, you know, you know at new options. For the, what do you think that I mean landscape looks like? Certainly there's definitely opportunities. It, it's really going to depend on how long we're in this for. Um, if it's, if it's going to be, um, if it's going to make sense really to try and do that, because um, if we, you know, if, and when we do things, we like to do them really well. And so it's obviously not the same experience, um, you know, doing this type of work um, virtually, but mm -hmm. that being said, we are, we are doing our best to just keep in touch with our community, offer it, offer resources, integration support, but also just general mental health support. We've got a bunch of content that's in the works right now, just being processed that we plan to release really soon, um, including an interview with the healers, um, which has been something that's been a, a cool thing, you know, during the downtime is people um, just have a lot of questions about the culture and, you know, it's not mm -hmm. stuff that we can always get all the way into during the retreat itself. And so, um, you know, just trying to like stay connected with the community that way, offer things, um, you know, they were gracious enough to say that we can record some Icaros um, for the community as well uh, during the next ceremony that we do. So, um, yeah, so trying to kind of just stay in contact, um, you know, on a larger scale, that's, that's sort of, it's a big undertaking to kind of shift the whole business model. So it is really mm -hmm. going to depend on kind of the length of time that we're in this. Yeah, it's just, it's just such uncertainty at the moment, you know, and it, it's, it's so weird to think that when, like at the point when I first reached out to you guys to have this conversation, which was you know, yeah, just before New Year, we were, we were in a completely different world and yeah. that, that we're even having these conversations in such a, such a short span of time is just, it's just nuts. So yeah, I mean, I, yeah. obviously my, my heart goes out to you guys. I really hope you sort of managed to weather the storm and I'm sure you will because I know you're both, like I say, very entrepreneurial. Well, um, I am. I'm moving away from the sort of the doom and gloom of, of the <laughs> sort of coronavirus. If we can sort of like backtrack to some of the stuff you mentioned earlier. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd like to come to you, Danny. I mean, you, you sort of, you very calmly sort of like throw in like, oh yeah, and I, 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 would, I was, you know, arranging these tours in the Amazon and then I built a center. Yeah, these are all, 
huge things, mate. So I'd like to unpack <laughs> unpack these a little bit. Casual. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of that that sort of movement from what you described as you doing your own tours to kind of self you know self finance yeah. to this point where you now make this physical center. What does that that leap look like? And I think I actually, if I remember, a, a, there was a part in, in your book where you talked about some of the motivation of why you did that. And it was because you were just tired of getting dicked around by different <laughs> different places. But how can you just like, you know, I, I myself, I, I spend quite a lot of time on Reddit and, and a lot of people ask these ask questions like, how do you do this? How do you, how does like a, a gringo end up in the middle of nowhere with, well, like you say, no roads, and then you just this center springs up. Just well, first you learn Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you have to be um, you have to be very adaptable and resourceful, and um, I would say uh, risk tolerance mm -hmm. and. Um, probably confident in one's own problem solving abilities and maybe even in such a way that um, perhaps even stupidly so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm a lot more risk averse now than I was, but you know, I, I think I was kind of in a place where I really had nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I hated working. Like I, I had, I was working a sales job which I, you know, is clearly not a long-term possibility. I, I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't keep a job for more than a year and a half. I was 30 years old going on 30 and uh, actually 31. But um, yeah, the, the actual straw that broke the camel's back there was I had, um, I had people booked for a retreat uh, in uh, September of 2014, I have one guy booked, one guy who paid his deposit. And at that point, I was already struggling with the management of this job I was working. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, dating uh, Tatiana, who you probably met yep. from, from Pulse. Um, we were both interested in, in entrepreneurship. I was already a big fan of Tim Ferriss and the four hour work week. And yep. so I already had an idea that I wanted to go there. And, uh, I was finishing a master's degree at that time. So I kind of had a little more confidence in terms of like, well, if I fail, I can get back into the workforce and, and, and make money back, you know? Um, but, but the straw that broke the camel's back was, I had this guy booked. His name was Emil uh, Karas. Emil Karas. And um, he paid his deposit. He was booked in for a, a September retreat. And this was in June. And the retreat center that we had booked for that retreat said, no, sorry, we don't have any more spaces left. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, we looked at different options at different retreat centers because at that time we were just booking space in other retreat centers and, and including that as part of a broader journey, right? Yeah. And uh, we just, we, you know, like we were basically, as you said, getting dicked around by other retreat centers, not having, we were just constantly dependent on their decision. So I was putting my reputation and other people's money on the line making commitments of people when someone uh, from a, a given retreat center could at any moment just say, Oh, sorry, we're not going to host you or sorry, we don't have any more space left yeah. or whatever change plans. In other words. Um, and I didn't like being in that position. So I said, you know what? We have a decision here. It's either give email his money back or Build a retreat center. <laughs> For it to host him in September? Yes. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. So, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I mean, we, we had already been kind of talking about it, but I was hesitant because of the risk mm -hmm. involved. 
And because I, quite frankly, I didn't want to run a retreat center. I was going to Niwe Rao a lot and seeing how frazzled and frayed they all were from this 24 hours, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year job. And I, I didn't want to do it. It wasn't really my forte, I didn't think. So, you know, it, it really, I was hesitating and then that happened and I was like, okay, well, let's just do it. Let's bite the bullet and do it. That's customer service right there. <laughs> so so I, I went out, you know, I, I, I basically, I needed to find some money. So like I, I already had existing kind of reservations coming in, mm -hmm. you know, and we had, we were established on, uh, what was it? I advisor. Yeah. And, um, you know, we kind of was like, okay, we already, I already was generating some business. So I had some proof of concept and some revenue coming in and I needed more. Um, so, you know, I asked a couple of people I knew and the only person who really was interested in helping me out was, was my dad because, you know, he, <clears throat> he had seen that I just kind of gone through this rite of passage in the, in the previous two years uh, by, you know, completing a master's degree while I was working full time and building the beginning stages of, of Pulse, right? So... Mm -hmm. It was kind of like, he was like, okay, I, now I, I believe that you have the ability to stick to something and, and have some kind of high output professional quality to what you do. And, um, you know, so he lent me a, a small amount of money. It was only 20,000 US dollars, which he lent me on a five year repayment term. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, plus the, the revenues I was bringing in from, from future bookings went down to Peru and just falls to the wall, man. Just, just, you know, we built the first phase of, of that center in five weeks. It was like, we had 20 or 30 guys from the local village, just give it her like every day for five weeks. It was, uh, it was incredible. Um, Crazy. Yeah, I, think, I think that was one of the one of the first kind of YouTube videos I, I, I saw of you guys was when you, you do videos of actually building the Maloka and stuff like that, and they're always these, yeah, these, these like it just also yeah. In fact, you did a similar thing as well as Saltara, just just showing these things going up piece by piece, and it's just such a yeah. It was it, I thought you guys all were always very good with your social media presence, and I think that's what's one of the ways that I I found Pulse. Um, because you did a lot of uh, a lot of YouTube stuff and also a presence on Reddit, but just in in terms of that, go, you know, going procuring is this? I mean, is is there some sort of like real estate agent for just going buying a piece of jungle land in the middle? I, of I, I, I went out to the village and talked to the mayor, and you know, he's in bare feet. He <laughs> went on a. I went out there in uh, March of 2014 just as the water, the high water season was kind of coming down. So mm -hmm. that property was still flooded for the most part. So we literally, uh, I went out to the village on a boat, you know, it's four hours from Iquitos, talked to the village, talked to the mayor, and we paddled over in a dugout canoe um, with the mayor in bare feet. He's like paddling with a stick over to the property from the village. And we just looked at the property. I took some video and I'm like, yeah, this would be perfect. It's right on the river's edge. And uh, he's just like, yeah, man, you guys can come and build here. I didn't actually buy the property. He's just like, you can just come and build here. You can use the property for free. Just give people work in the village. Oh, wow. They wanted jobs. So, you know, we came in, we didn't pay anything for the property. We we uh, we paid like a monthly contribution to the village and we did other things like we ins we installed uh, solar power yeah, across yeah. the whole village, right? So we gave them all free electricity um, and contributed to various public works and stuff like that. But the main impact was giving, you know, a couple dozen people work or a dozen people work or whatever it was from the village. And, uh, you know, that 
to date is still sustaining them for the large part that like that center is still in operation, right? I mean, that's awesome. That's a, a, a real, you know, when, when a lot of people, there's, there's some kind of scorn against like the ayahuasca sort of tourism industry. And I think what you've laid out and, you know, I've, I've seen it myself, the sort of the collaboration between what you built there and the village of Libertad. And it's a beautiful thing. It's, I think that's something, you, you know, you, you can really be, uh, be proud of mate. I mean, and I am proud of it. I was proud of it. I am proud of it. I'm glad that what we built there is still sustaining that village, man. Yeah. You know, I love those people. I really, really do. I love the village. I love those people. You know, they're great people, great, honest, hardworking people and uh, really, really friendly and nice. And, and they, you know, they were a huge uh, part of, of kind of my, uh, of our journeys, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, no, it's great, man. Yeah, I mean, and it's also interesting to hear you sort of talk about that this wasn't your, your actual intention and that you didn't think this was something you wanted to do because that's, that center was, you know, at the time when I first went there, um, you know, like the highest rated on sort of I advisor, you know, it was very, you know, everyone just, just said had nothing but positive things to say about Pulse. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was, and I think I, when you mentioned earlier as well about how you sort of, you, you were grieving for handing, you know, for, for getting rid of it. I can imagine it, you, it, you could feel the sort of the love and the passion that had gone into that place from, from all of you guys, you know, it was a, you could see it was a real sort of family vibe. Well, just to sort of like, you know, move this, the story on it. So you, you decided to, to you, your journey had come to an end with, with Pulse and you wanted to sort of move on to something new. So at the time when you were, when you, you sold it, you knew you, 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 there was like a, a phase two in the works and you knew you were going to go on to, to build something else. Is that, is that correct? Sorry? I got to say, you, you knew, but at the time you were selling Pulse, you, you already had the kind of vision in mind for what was going to become Saltara. Well, I, I didn't really intend on it um, in the beginning, but as the transition happened, it, it just kind of became clear that, you know, the, 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 the team we had built uh, wanted to stay together, uh, in, in, including myself. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was like, well, okay, well, I, I can't undo that transaction. So I need to do something new. And, and you know, it, was, it actually all came from a conversation I had with my father was, you know, I was feeling some remorse for actually selling a place. Um, but he basically said, I mean, do you really want to be there? Like it's, you know, it wasn't like if that place was located in Costa Rica, I'd be, I'd, I'd still had it. Mm -hmm. It was mainly the, the challenges around operating out of Iquitos, which, which, uh, you know, kind of soured my experience there. Mm. Um, but, you know, so it was like, I was remorseful for changing the, the vibe there, um, including the impact it had on the team. But at the same time, I didn't want to be back there. Uh, I didn't, because of Iquitos. Yeah. And, the only logical step, and, and this is actually my father's idea, and I was resistant to it at the beginning, was, you know, why don't you go and do something in Costa Rica? It's a nice country, you know, it's easy to get to, it's, you know. And it was actually my dad, as I was humming and hawing about that and being resistant to it, who searched up the property that we ended up buying in like five minutes <laughs> it was the first on his laptop. And he's like, what about this property? It's the first <laughs> one he showed me. Turns out it was the absolute perfect property. So perfect. As soon as I saw it, I'm like, oh, <laughs> maybe that would work. Yeah. And then, so on the one hand, you've got a key toss. They're just like this absolute epitome of chaos. And in the hand, you've got this beach. Oh, the two things <laughs> exactly. I remember visiting the property for the first time too, several months later. And uh, there was this just, perfectly it was like kind of right on the edge of a cliff and you know you could like walk down to the beach um and like kind of right at the tip there was this open clearing 
with just surrounded by trees you could hear the ocean waves from it there was like this big beautiful tree kind of overlooking and i just remember looking at dan being like this was made to have a maloka on it like <laughs> you can't think of a more perfect location mm-hmm. and it was like an f yes at that point <laughs> yeah i mean i've seen some of, like some of the videos i'm, I'm good friends with uh, uh shube who I think is one of your investors oh, i yeah. think and um yeah we, we were on a retreat together a few a few years ago and he's, he's from manchester where i'm from and uh, yeah, so he's, he's constantly, you know, with the times he's been out there, he's posting like loads of videos on Instagram. He also makes great videos. Yeah. <laughs> he, he does. He's so creative. It's some of that. I mean, I, I don't know if you have you seen his the stuff he's been coming out with while he's been um, in quarantine, but he's, he's doing these music videos. Yeah, he's posting a music. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's absolutely nuts. But yeah, I love that guy. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, the location you've got there is absolutely amazing. So it definitely felt like it was like led by the plants to be perfectly honest. Like I yeah. feel like I was recruited by the plants, like that all the way everything just kind of fell out. It was like, this just felt like somehow divinely guided, you know, I don't really ask too many questions, but yeah, it definitely felt like it was meant to be. Mm. I, did, I did wonder if, if like, if a ketos itself would be a fact, because it's, it's a strange thing when you, you, you go out to these, these retreats in the Amazon and the retreats themselves are so in these beautiful locations and, and it's just so peaceful. But yeah, Iquitos is just like insanity encapsulated, I think. And it's uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's, it's very, particularly when you sort of go there for the first time, like, you know, I'm quite, quite naive and you sort of, wow, I'm here to, you know, this spiritual thing. And it's like, oh my, it just hits you in the face. Or, and I, I always wondered like what it would be like to be, yeah, to be basically living there like you guys were and sort of constantly dipping into that world. I imagine it would sort of take a toll so I could completely get it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, after, after a while, it was just like the energetic toll it took to kind of navigate that. And, and it's also different to <clears throat> coming as um, like a visitor or a tourist versus actually like having to run a business, interact on that sort of institutional, financial, logistical level. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, which, which definitely was a lot more complex than you'd ever think at face value. Yeah. So I suppose, that, so what, what you guys did with this move to Costa Rica is, is I think part of this is of what's going on at the moment. There is this global expansion of, of ayahuasca comes out of the jungle, out of its native setting, and it's kind of expanding. And even though sort of Costa Rica, it's, it has, it's still this kind of jungle setting. It is, it, it's not the, the sort of the indigenous sort of home. And I sort of, I'm also dabbling in this world because I do some retreats here in Europe with sort of with Wheeler and Tamara, who obviously you guys nice. know. So it's, yeah, what are, what are your thoughts on, on that, on this, on this kind of expansion thing? Because you've got some people who are very traditional and it's like, it's got to be in Peru. If you're not in Peru, then it's, that's not it. Obviously you guys are doing something, something different, but you're, importing a kind of Peru in there. So just, it, could you just expand a little bit on what the sort of your, your mindset is there around the kind of this blend you have between the tradition, but yet you're kind of part of the expansion. Yeah. I mean, it certainly comes with its own set of risks that this is expanding into the world, you know, in all sorts of ways. And there's, you know, there's the psychedelic Renaissance that's happening kind of globally as well. And then, Um, you know, there's this, this interaction, um, between, you know, medicinal decriminalization, legalization, medicalization, like how does that all fit into, um, you know, the, the indigenous roots and and the healing systems and healthcare systems that this comes from. And, um, you know, there's cultural interactions and I mean, it's certainly, there's a lot of different branches of this um, Mm. that that are happening right now and um, I think it's really good for people to just try and educate themselves as best as possible Um, because one of the things that you know I I talk to a lot of people that are um, looking to to do ayahuasca and it's it can be really hard to know there's so much information out there it can be really hard to know what questions to ask even Mm. when you're about to embark on this Um, this journey with plant medicine. And so, you know, from that perspective, it's like, you really want to know who it is that you're working with, what kind of experience they have, what is their connection to the indigenous roots or the tradition or, you know, wherever it is that um, they're coming from, if there are any roots there, 
Um, and if they've trained, then how long have they trained? You know, what kind of container do they have? What is the safety? What is the ratio? Um, you know, how are you giving back to the communities that you are partaking in this medicine? Mm -hmm. um, you know, reciprocity is certainly a big thing that I think can easily get lost in this expansion. And that's something that, um, you know, we, we work really hard to just try and maintain that connection and make sure that we are giving back as much as possible. We just raised $10,000 for the Amazon fund. Um, you know, and just, and, and really trying to honor where it comes from. And, you know, that has, um, it's the right thing to do. And it also has an, an energetic effect on the experience too, I think. So there's, there's definitely a lot to consider. Um, and then, you know, people getting very cavalier about it and maybe doing some ayahuasca ceremonies themselves and then feeling as if they're qualified to, you know, hold a space for other people. Mm -hmm. um, or even offer preparation and integration support, you know, that's even something that you really want to make sure that you have the right training and experience and that you've done enough of your own work to, um, to be able to do that. And so there's, there's definitely a lot of questions. Um, we work very closely with um, Bia Labate, who's one of yeah. our advisors. And, um, you know, she's, she's an anthropologist. She spent decades, um, in South America, in Latin America, just really um, working closely with different communities and also studying the expansion. And uh, one thing that I really love about the work that she does is that she really tries to be this bridge between kind of the global North um, and, and the, um, you know, the South and, and the shamanic traditions and people. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, I, I, try and learn as much as I can from her um, and, you know, really put into practice those things so that we can be more of a bridge, you know, like we're very careful. We don't use the word authentic on our website. Like mm -hmm. what is authentic? Well, you know, that, that's kind of a buzzword. And even, um, even tradition, you know, we're not traditional. We are guided by Shakiba healers, but, you know, if you want the tradition, you're not necessarily going to have the same level of support um, that, you know, more centers that cater to, you know, the global North would, would have in place, you know, we work with psychotherapists. Um, so, so where we, where the medicine work and the energetic work comes in, we really leave that to the healers and they set that space. We don't offer any other energy work besides, so, you know, while they're, while people are very open and undergoing this work with ayahuasca, um, we actually initially started offering massages, but then we actually stopped doing that because the dealers were like, we don't really want other people touching people. So like we just offer kind of supportive practices that people can do on their own, like yoga, meditation, a little bit of light breath work, but we don't want to alter anyone's consciousness with like transformational breath work or other practices. Um, so, you know, tr it, it is, it's an interesting line to walk, you know, and I, I definitely, um, try as much as I can to um, see how we can serve the movement in the best way possible and be that bridge um, where, you know, when it comes to the medicine space, that is something that we're very, you know, guided by the Shipibo tradition. And then where it comes to people integrating afterwards um, or finding practices that can support them when they go home, you know, we work with psychologists who have plant medicine experience and yeah, so it's a, it's an interesting. I think it's it's good to ask the hard questions a lot, mm -hmm. and um, whether you're you know in the in the industry or field itself, or and also when you're you know looking to partake in um, plant medicine, just asking, making sure you have you know the information to make a good decision. Um, mm -hmm. so there's a lot out there. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the things I would say that you guys do really well there at Saltar. It's you, it's not it doesn't come across as you're just trying to imitate what's going on in Peru, in Costa Rica. It's, it's got its own identity. You know, you have these things with these kind of guest speakers that I know you're having with your sort of, you know, Dorian Yates and your sort of uh, mm -hmm. Brian Rose and stuff. And it's even this, the center itself, it's, it, it's got this kind of, this fusion look of the, the you know, the, the, okay, I shouldn't use the word traditional, but this kind of jungle natural setting, but it's very modern. It's very sort of, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's got its own sort of feel to it. So I think that's, you know, that balance that you want really well. And also along with the kind of the communication that you put out, I mean, I mentioned earlier about the sort of the emails you put out. I've seen you guys doing like symposiums and stuff like that. You're very, 
transparent in, in what you put out there. So I think as part of that bridging process, you guys sort of do really well. But I just want to uh, just home in on the, on the topic you we mentioned earlier about integration, because I know this is something that is really sort of dear to you guys, and you've made a big push around this integration work. And again, I think it, that is a critical element of this expansion, because as it expands out of Peru, um, you know, we need more of this integration because we don't have that cultural framework to really sort of, yeah, process these things in the same way that the kind of the indigenous people do in Peru. You know, it's, I, I was saying to one guy, like, you know, if I, I could go into work and, you know, say on a Monday and say, you know, I, I just got engaged or, you know, I, my, my kid was just born and everyone would pat me on the back and say, oh, wow, that's amazing. But if I went into work on Monday and said, well, I just had my mind absolutely blown, like, and yeah, I'm just, you know, processing, then everyone would look at me like I'm an alien. So <laughs> I think this, this kind of integration element where we can, yeah, to give us, us that kind of framework is a really important element. So maybe if you could just like expand on like, I suppose for anybody who doesn't know, what, what are we talking about? When, when you say integration, what, what does integration mean at Saltar and what is this, this process that you're, you're trying to promote yeah absolutely so i mean it's 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 an interesting word because now a couple of years later it's actually kind of starting to become this buzzword um you know and you know what exactly is integration um you know we're always integrating we're always taking the experiences of our lives and seeing how they fit into our identity and our choices and then how we move forward from there um so integration of this, there's kind of two paths to this. There's integration of the self, which is the, the purpose of healing, really, um, as you know, as, as we kind of um, approach it. And then there's also integration of the experience when you go back home. And so, how do you take these lessons where your mind is blown open? You have this, you know, potentially, you know, deeper connection to something, whether that's yourself, your higher self, or divine power, um, you know, the plants, and, you know, maybe there's insights, maybe there's, you know, things revealed within you that have gotten really stirred up, and you're not necessarily sure what to make of it. And then, you know, you have this kind of specific container where that this work occurs, and, and it's very deep work, and you're very open. Um, and then you're, you're put back into your regular life, you know, with potentially the same surroundings, the same people, you know, um, the same temptations, how do you actually make something of that experience? Um, and that to me is kind of the integration work that we focus on, you know, taking that um, experience and, and translating it into positive change back home that really serves you. Um, you know, that can take, that can, it looks different for everyone and it can take a lot of time. Um, one thing that, you know, we really stress at Soltara is that ayahuasca is not a panacea. It's not a silver bullet. You know, we are not in the purpose of saying that you're going to feel absolutely amazing as soon as you leave. Um, sometimes it can take time to feel um, better. Sometimes you have to feel worse first, um, you know, that that's actually part of this uh, cleaning process. You know, a lot of deep energetic work that's being done. So we really try and ground people in the reality of that potential and manage those expectations um, pretty much from the time that they book the retreat, you know, when we're sharing information and, you know, even before they book the retreat. Um, and then when they get to the retreat, uh, one of the first things we give them is this journal that we uh, came up with called the Heroes Journal. Yeah. And that was a collaborative effort between um, myself, some of the team, and our psychologist advisors. Um, it basically follows, it, it kind of mimics a psychological treatment framework, but it's adapted to the ayahuasca experience. And it's very much, like it's meant to be very accessible. So um, takes you through kind of like checking in with yourself, self-inquiry, um, setting your intentions, what are, where are you starting? What do you want to work on? Uh, taking you through some tools that can help you navigate the ceremony space. Um, we have workshops throughout the retreat as well that refer back to the book. So, um, you know, what is shadow work? You know, how do how can we reframe things without necessarily with while still maintaining the truth and the authenticity of those feelings? Um, you know. Healing is not necessarily a straight line, it's a spiral, you know, so different concept of the book is kind of a, uh, a build your own integration plan. So 
you know, our, our purpose is not to tell you how to integrate. It's really just to present as many resources and tools as possible that we found helpful that, you know, you can take back with you, um, that it's, it's kind of like what we wish we would have had, um, to really be like, okay, looking at your immediate integration, you know, how, like, what do boundaries look like? What are boundaries? How do you have good boundaries? How do you know if you do, you know, um, what are kind of habits you want to start? So just different tools like that, um, to just give yourself a cushion and, and set yourself up for success when you go home. Um, and then we also offer, um, individual and group sessions with uh, a psychologist who has a lot of experience with plant medicine. Um, And we also offer three months of resources that uh, after the retreat, which kind of track your progress. So, okay, you know, you're exiting the, you know, post dieta restrictions, Um, you know, you're, you're maybe welcoming new food into your life, but like, what does nutrition look like for you? How do you listen to your body? Um, it's meant to be very self-empowering. Um, and so, you know, we're really just here to kind of present things, but ultimately um, we feel like people, people are their own healers. And, you know, when you can tap into that, like that is the approach to healing that I feel like is missing in a lot of the Western approach, you know, mm-hmm. so that's kind of our um, desire to just help people feel empowered and, you know, find what works for them. Yeah, I think that 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 framework that you just talked about that is I think is missing from a lot of of ayahuasca retreats and certainly what what I noticed is you get a, a lot of people who aren't prepared for that what you talked about of that you know things getting more difficult after you leave the retreat and they so everyone wants to have this big life changing experience and and they sort of they lose a bit of the focus between what's the afterglow of the medicine and then yeah this kind of what can be uh like a roller coaster almost depression that can sort of hit you afterwards if if you and then you sort of get the feeling like oh i've done something wrong or it's not worked or whatever and so yeah i think that the the honesty of of that approach is is uh yeah very very valuable then that's so powerful with the right framework too because then instead of like my like i i personally went through this i know people very close to me went through the same thing where you know, they, they had a bit of an afterglow period. And we talk about that too, you know, that that is a thing. You might be more sensitive. You might be in a state of euphoria. You might not be, you know, who knows, but, um, but that then after that, you know, it's possible that you can actually feel, feel worse. And, you know, for some people that can trigger these, these deeper um, frameworks within the narratives that they've been holding that, oh, did I do it wrong? Did I fail? Does ayahuasca not like me? Mm-hmm. You know, am I not good enough to get the healing? Do I not deserve it? And, you know, when you're, if, if you kind of don't take the approach and aren't able to kind of step outside that and be like, oh, this is helping me identify these narratives that have been running my life. And maybe this is the chance where they're actually coming out and I can reassess them. But if you don't have the, the framework or support system to do that, you can kind of just go back into those, you know, habits and patterns and then it can be, you know, it can be destructive. Um, and so, yeah, definitely it's about, I think, tempering a little bit of those um, expectations and then just giving people the tools to be like, I can identify that and I'm outside of it now so I can work with it differently. Yeah, I think it also highlights just the sort of the difference between like a retreat like you guys are offering and this sort of DIY approach. And you see a lot of people who sort of criticize retreats as being just some sort of it's it's just rich dickheads wasting money, you know, getting high. But they kind of fail to see that you're getting this. There is a full care package around this thing. It's not just, yeah, paying to get high for, you know, for a week or two. Right. And, uh, and I think that's how you guys carry that on pulse retreat. Again, I think it's something that's missing from a, a lot of sense. So it's a really cool thing. I am, I am a conscious of the, of the time for you guys. I did put out uh, some, uh, what I was going to do, you know, I was doing this on Reddit and I got some sort of quick questions back. So if you can give me sort of 10 more minutes, I'll just fire some quick questions at you from, uh, from my Reddit users. Sure. Um, yeah, so, Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> so, Form for, for, uh, is a, do you have a protocol for handling medical emergencies? We do. So we are uh, 20 minutes away from a 24-hour clinic. 
um, which is really great. And so luckily we've only had uh, one person slip and uh, hurt their head that we've had to use, but we have a fully stocked medical kit on site. Um, and then our intake process is actually one of the strictest intake processes that I've seen, um, which, which is really great. So we, we collaborate with um, a medical advisor as well as a, a psychotherapist uh, when we screen people and we really try and get a full picture of um, people's medical history and any possible medical risks or contraindications, which could present any problems with uh, working with ayahuasca, tapering schedules, things like that, um, that need to happen oftentimes under doctor supervision. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if people are, if there's any sense that there might be some um, contraindications, uh, you know, what we'll do is we'll, we'll refund the deposit and help them to set up a plan for, um, okay, we'd like to see you work with a therapist. We'd like to have your therapist just get in touch with us, you know, things like that, and um, kind of build out a plan. Um, so our intake process really stops um, most of the risk, I would say. Um, and then that being said, we're, we're connected to the local clinic and, um, you know, we are, we always have an emergency car on site and, um, yeah, just a, a logistical protocol for that. As if well. there's ever anything really serious that goes beyond the local clinic, I mean, we're just a few hours drive away from a top notch private clinic in San Jose. Yeah. Yeah. Easy to get to. The, the healthcare is actually quite good here. Yeah. Um, I don't think the same could be said for like the middle of the Amazon jungle. So definitely a more accessible place. <laughs> yeah, that, that was actually one of, one of the times that I was in the Amazon and I was having a really difficult night. And that was the kind of thing that came to me. It's like, what, whatever happens to me now, I'm about, I'm probably 12 hours away from anywhere. <laughs> you know, even if they called the boat right now, I'm still like, it's like, yeah. it was for the boat to get here four hours. So yeah, I was really freaking out. Yeah. Uh, um, so just back to that sort of what I mentioned before about, you know, the people who are against the idea of paying for something like ayahuasca or that even that the idea of paying for spiritual healing is wrong. Just in a, in a sort of a nutshell, what, how would you address that sort of comment? Yeah. So, I mean, in general, you know, healthcare is healthcare and what essentially the level that the, that the healers are that we work with, um, you know, the level of training that they go through, I mean, they really dedicate their life mm -hmm. to this. Um, and, you know, that that is something that it's like, you wouldn't expect a surgeon to give his services for free, you know, after they've spent years, decades, really mastering their craft. Um, you know, there's a whole, you know, we work with psychotherapists, you wouldn't necessarily expect therapy to be free in that way, too. Mm -hmm. You know, all these things really cost, cost money. Um, you know, it's not like we're driving Rolls Royces around here, you know, it's, it's really, we, we do our best to, to have a dedicated team of highly qualified, highly experienced people. Um, and, you know, to expect healers to do this spiritual work, um, you know, offering it to, to us for free is not something that we um, would expect at all. And so, you know, I think there is this element of like, um, it, I, I don't necessarily think it, it aligns with the way that most other healing work is approached and this is a very old healthcare system and so that's essentially you know it costs money i mean yeah. it's hard work man it's really it's very, hard, very, very hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah i mean you, I, you don't have to convince me man i i constantly i've used those same kind of kind of arguments and it, it, it kind of it does annoy me a little bit particularly this there's this line around the sort of like you know the, the mystical savage of like, why, a sh sh why would shaman want a, a mobile phone? Why, why, and it's like, why don't they want, why would a shaman want, you know, clothes or something? It's like, well, yeah, they, you know, they're, they're just people. They still want to totally. we, we, I mean, live in this world. Be, bro. Yeah, we've, we've all got families they've got, be. You know, and mm -hmm. it's actually been great because like in a way, um, like for example, Wheeler, the healer that we used to work with at Pulse, um, you know, from working with us, he was able to um, have running water for his whole mm -hmm. village and install that, you know, and so, and, and, but I understand the spirit of the question, like the commodification of the sacred is absolutely something to think about, you know, and I think ultimately, um, it really matters what your intention in getting in the business of healing actually is, you know, is yeah. the intention um, to purely profit as much as you can off of people like that are vulnerable looking for healing. Or is your intention to actually help, you know, bring healing 
um, to people. And, you know, so I think the intention does matter. And I think it's an important question um, yep. to ask. And, um, and yeah, and, and I would say for sure, it's, it's, it's hard work and nobody works for free. So nobody yep. works for free. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, fuel every month I can prove it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another question. Um, do you guys grow your own plant materials or how, you know, how are you, it, 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 I suppose the question is like, is ayahuasca sustainable and what are you guys doing to sort of ensure that? Yeah, so we have, uh, we cook our medicine down in Peru. So mm -hmm. we work with a family of, uh, of, in a village, one of the healers that we used to work with and their family um, makes the ayahuasca down there into a, a paste and then ships it up and we, we reconstitute it. So we really wanted it to be made down in the jungle. Um, I think every single one of the healers that we work with uh, are also replanting ayahuasca and chacruna um, across many, many hectares in the jungle um, in and around their villages. And we also, part of the Amazon fund that we raised um, is also going to go towards just replanting wild ayahuasca, not for cultivation, but just to add it back in. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, um, it's definitely a really good question. I think every, every center should be pretty cognizant of the way that they're approaching that and the, how the healers that they're working with are getting it. Chris yeah. Killen, AKA the medicine hunter yep. published a paper recently about, um, about ayahuasca sustainability. And he basically went in down to Peru and did a study, a, a thorough study to try to bust this myth that ayahuasca is unsustainable. I mean, if you uh, only harvest wild ayahuasca unimpededly, like, like for a long time without replanting, then of course it's not sustainable. But the fact is that plants are easy to grow. These plants mm -hmm. are easy to grow and they're valuable. They're worth money and should people use them? So there are just lots of people that are planting vines and, and chacruta bushes on very inexpensive land, intending to it. And, 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 and ayahuasca grows in the forest, in the shade. So yeah, uh, you're not knocking down forests to have like a monocul uh, monoculture kind of crop. And, and they actually and, like need the trees to wrap around. And stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so Chris's findings were that uh, the ayahuasca is being harvested in a sustainable way. It's just that the, the rate of replanting has to match the rate of harvesting from the wild. But it is. There are lots of uh, people planting it, lots of villages planting it. So. Good. Um, so one question was regarding sort of you guys as a center. Is with, with the kind of the, the best practices that you guys are doing and the sort of the, is there a community of centers or do you all kind of like do your own thing or do you, is there some kind of place where you, you guys are exchanging ideas to, to get to a kind of a, a level of best practice for all centers or is it just you guys purely in isolation? So right now in Costa Rica, we are the only entirely Shipibo led uh, center here. Um, I, it's my understanding that there might be other centers that kind of do different types and sometimes bring in Shipibo healers. Um, but there's not really anybody kind of doing it here that necessarily is aligned with the way that, um, we just prefer to work with ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So in terms of the community, I mean, I think it's, it's a place that is, growing in terms of um, medicine circles and, and centers and retreat centers coming here. I think that will grow in the coming years. Um, but I think we're, we're kind of early in, in the um, tip of the wave here, uh, as far mm -hmm. as I know, unless you have any insights. Well, I mean, we're, we're in touch with other centers and do share things and discuss, you know, but people do things differently in different ways. And, we do try to learn from our experience in the field and, and we do have employees that have worked at various other centers. That's true. And, Peru, and, 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 you know, are kind of trying to learn from everyone else's mistakes and, uh, and wins. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's some elements of collaboration. 
So last question. So I mean, you guys, you, you know, very sort of invested in the Shipibo tradition. What do you think of sort of non-native shamans, like the kind of things that are popping up in like reality shows at the moment? Uh, I don't know if you've seen this, this like a, a reality show, I think, based in the States with sort of non-native shamans. Do you think, is this a positive thing? Or do you think that that element should, re should remain as, as a sort of a native practice? I think I, <laughs> I love that look. certainly have an opinion about that. Um, yeah, I think you just have to be careful. You know, mm -hmm. I think that there's, there, it, it's already happening. Um, you know, I think that, like I was saying before, there's definitely questions that you want to make sure you ask. Um, and there's also kind of cultural questions that you want to ask too, you know, um, colonialist, colonialism and cultural appropriation is a thing. It's, you know, hard questions that, you know, we really try and ask ourselves a lot and really be honest with ourselves about the answers and do the best that we can. And, um, you know, I think there's, there are people with really good intentions out there. And I think that there are also people without really good intentions and, mm -hmm. um, or confidence. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's a safety factor, of course. Right. Um, yeah. you know, I was actually just listening to a, um, a, uh, conference, uh, uh, session from a, uh, someone from the, one of the Brazilian, um, tribes about ayahuasca. And, uh, this was in the psychedelic Liberty summit, which highly recommend everyone watch the videos on Chaprina's, uh, YouTube They're They're all online now. Um, and one of them, I wish I could remember her name right now. Um, but, uh, she, she was like, this whole concept of neo shamanism is crazy to me because, mm -hmm. you know, we, people like we dedicate decades of our lives to even do the self work first. And, um, sorry, there's just a plane. <laughs> <laughs> Tough times, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, the, this whole neo shamanism is very uh, interesting concept to her because, um, because, you know, you're like, she's like, my grandfather is a shaman, but he's 105. Mm -hmm. Like, he's not like, he, this is like a, a 60, 70 year practice for him that he's really dedicated his life to. And, you know, when people just kind of do a few ceremonies and, you know, call themselves a shaman and think that they can run circles, like not only is that really unsafe, but to her, it's very disrespectful to yeah. their culture and tradition. And so, um, you know, I, I'm not in the business of saying what anyone should do, but I do think there are hard questions and I think it's really good to just be informed um, about the culture and tradition before you kind of enter and open yourself up to this world because um, it's a complex one. The first uh, question should probably be, how many years have you spent dieting in the Amazon? Mm -hmm. How many diets have you done? You know, what trees have you dieted? What plants have you dieted? Yeah. yeah. Depending on the tradition, yeah. Yeah, I think it, it's, 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 I mean, I must say that the, the Neo Shaman label really annoys me um, just because of that sort of, it, this, this self-declaration and, and you just would not do it in any of No one would declare themselves a Neo pilot or a Neo brain surgeon. So that's, you know, putting a scalpel to her head. The other thing she said was that it was like a self-declaration and that she was mm -hmm. like, you have to be like, you have to achieve and be, a, and then show that you are able to do this over many. Yeah. And it wasn't something that you label yourself. Um, yeah. I think. Yeah. That's and especially when you think it's like, what's at stake, because we're talking about people's like, you know, psychological health and for something that, you know, pretty, if you ask the question, everyone would agree, this is like the most important thing. Then why would you like suddenly declare yourself the expert of, you know, of this thing? And, and, yeah, I'd, I'd say I find that it's, it is one of those things that gets under my skin a bit, the, the, the New York channel. Sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well, guys, I mean, you've been super generous with your time, so I, I, I won't keep you on uh, much longer. Just before we get off, um, is there anywhere you want to sort of point people towards if they want to keep up with what you guys are doing or what's happening at Soltara? Where should people go look? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can check out our website, soltara.co. Um, and you can also search Soltara Healing Center on Instagram or Facebook. I think we're on Twitter too, but Instagram is probably our main. Um, we got lots of 
beautiful pictures to share. So we try and do that regularly. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're keeping people updated, you know, as this thing progresses, um, we've held off, we've held off on taking customer bookings right now for at least the next, um, little bit, but we are hoping to, um, just get back, get back online very soon. So, um, yeah, we're still, we're still posting on social media. So definitely find us there. Yeah, well, I'll also call Melissa directly at <laughs> Get also do that. <laughs> well, I'll put some links in, in, the, in the description below, and uh, yeah, I'll sort of, I'll, I'll certainly be following what, what's happening with you guys and, and the current situation. Thanks, yeah. Robin. Thanks, thanks for everything that you do too, and you've been just such like such an awesome person to have in the community all these years. So really, really appreciate your support and all of the work you're doing as well. Oh, likewise. We also do a regular mailing list updates. So if people want to join the mailing list, that's really fun too. So mm -hmm. I just thought I just just want to mention. I know I am. I'm not going to let you off the hook, Melissa. You still owe me a book. So that's actually it's hilarious. I was just <laughs> writing this morning about how we. This is like our new approach to healing. Um, yeah, I. So Tara has taken over my life the last two years, but all of a sudden I have a lot more free time. So hoping to uh, have the first draft done this year and then looking at 2021. I have a hard time doing things if they're not like perfect. So that's it, been a process. I, th I think given what you guys have accomplished, it, it's pretty understandable. And also I think it's probably worth dropping in, you know, the documentaries and the sort of the other content that you guys do and your collaborations that you do with sort of, you know, with London Real and stuff like that. Oh, really great work. I'll, I say, I'll put some, uh, some links in the description below. So thank, thank you. you so much for your time, guys. Thanks for everything that you're doing. And yeah, I'm a huge fan of what you're doing. And I'm, I'm sure I will be out there at some point once all this, uh, this craziness is finished. Oh, yeah. You're always welcome, Rob. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, guys, well